a welcome and thank you for coming. Um, this is our second webinar in the 2017-2018 webinar series. Our theme this year is Geodynamics in the Classroom, in which our speakers will share their approaches in teaching geodynamical modeling using a variety of tools, including Python, MATLAB, and Jupyter Notebooks. Today's webinar, like all webinars, is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing through geodynamics.org. During the webinar, please use the chat window to type in your questions or to communicate with others. During the Q&A session at the end of the talk, please either indicate in the chat window that you have a question or turn on your microphone and video. So today's webinar speaker, I'm pleased to have today Professor Max Rudolph from UC Davis. Professor Rudolph received his PhD from UC Berkeley, working on problems related to eruptions of geysers, mud and magmatic volcanoes, and icy moons. He went on to do a postdoc at the University of Colorado on global scale mantle dynamics. His current research interests are large scale mantle structure, mantle viscosity structure, and the mechanics of erupting systems. He uses a wide variety of models in his research and teaching, which we'll learn more about in his talk today, tools and approaches for teaching computation and modeling geodynamics and beyond. Max, the screen is yours. Thank you, Lorraine. Thanks for the nice introduction and for the opportunity to talk a bit about something that I don't have a lot of experience talking about, but uh, actually the teaching side of my work. So today I'm going to tell you about some tools and approaches for teaching computation and modeling. And while this is a geodynamics themed seminar series, uh, I'm going to reach a bit beyond geodynamics and talk more generally about teaching modeling, which is something that I've done uh, at both the undergraduate and the graduate level. So I thought I'd motivate this by saying or asking, what do we want our students to know about modeling? Uh, for those of us who are deeply immersed in the field of geodynamical modeling, we know that all of the different um, aspects of our work that are listed here from what I'm calling here disciplinary aspects, things like identifying important scientific questions formulating testable hypotheses associated with those questions, physical aspects, um, things like understanding conservation laws, writing statements of balance, building intuition into model formulation, what should go into a model and what is best left out, or what can safely be omitted, formulating the mathematical descriptions of problems. We have to be able to do all of these things. In addition to that, there are very mathematical aspects to our work. We have to be able to obtain analytic solutions to equations. We have to understand um, how to discretize differential equations. We have to be able to prove stability and convergence for a number of different problems. We also have to understand how to choose and design linear solvers, preconditioners, uh, nonlinear solvers. And then there's a bunch of technical stuff that I've lumped into just a few bullet points, but ultimately it is what consumes a lot of our time programming, debugging programs, and then sysadmin kind of stuff, installing software and running systems. And depending on where we are and what kind of support we have, this is actually something that many of us have to do ourselves. So to be successful researchers, I think all of us have mastered each of these different tasks from the disciplinary aspects through the te technical aspects to varying degrees in order to be successful. Um, but when we go to teach the next generation, where should we place the emphasis at the undergraduate and at the graduate levels? And what tools and approaches in the classroom will best enable to us to pass on this knowledge? So I'm going to preface my next remarks by saying a little bit about my background. I guess I forgot to tell Lorraine to remind people that before I arrived at UC Davis in August, I was on the faculty in the geology department at Portland State University for about three and a half years. And there I taught a number of different classes, um, one of which was a 300 level, uh, that is junior level undergraduate class called Numerical Modeling of Earth Systems. This is a class that's required for undergraduate geology majors, and it attracts students with a broad range of interests. Um, many students go on to work in the private sector, and so they're interests are aligned with environmental and engineering geology. Other students are more academically inclined. Um, the students taking a class like this at the undergraduate level must have completed already differential and integral calculus 
but differential equations is not required as a prerequisite. Many students would have taken linear algebra or might be taking linear algebra simultaneously with this course. At the um, upper division undergraduate and the graduate level, I've taught geodynamics out of the Turcotte and Schubert textbook with an associated computer lab using a combination of the computer codes that are provided in the newest edition of Turcotte and Schubert and my own stuff, mostly using MATLAB. Here I assume differential and integral calculus. Finally, I've taught at the upper division graduate level, the 600 level, which is for advanced masters and PhD students, um, a geodynamic modeling specific class. I'll come back to that at the very end of this talk. And there I can assume the entire calculus sequence plus linear algebra. But again, not necessarily linear algebra. And both at Portland State and at UC Davis, I teach on the quarter system. That means that we have only a very short 10 week term. Typically I'll lecture three or four hours per week, and then we'll have either one or two three hour labs per week. When I taught the 300 level numerical modeling of Earth systems, we had six hours of lab per week, but in the uh, geodynamic uh, modeling classes at the 400 to 600 level, typically just one weekly lab. So what I'll do with the rest of the time is to first talk about experiences um, with undergraduate modeling education. I'll talk about the emphasis um, that I choose. I'll talk about the process of model development, which I think is at the core of what I try to teach the undergraduates. And then I'll give you a brief demo of Jupyter Hub. And if you don't know what that is, you'll get to see soon enough. And then I'll talk a little bit about graduate teaching. Here I have some experience using the mantle convection code aspect in the classroom. I'll talk a little bit about my experiences with that. And then I'll talk about one of the example um, exercises that was assigned to the graduate students in this class, um, verifying the linear stability analysis for the onset of convection in a fluid layer heated from below. So at the undergraduate level in a 10 week class, we can't do everything. So we have to pick and choose what we emphasize and what we save for future classes, perhaps classes offered in different departments that interested, motivated students can take uh, after my class if they're so inclined. So I think the most important things that we can pass on are these disciplinary aspects, how to identify questions and formulate hypotheses that can be answered through the development of mathematical or numerical models. The physical aspects, these basic ideas about developing conservation laws, developing physical intuition, and learning how to translate conceptual notions about how Earth behaves into mathematical descriptions of geologic processes. I also emphasize analytic solution techniques because before we jump into numerical solutions, we have to know whether the equations that we're dealing with are better solved using simple analytic approaches. In many cases, this is possible. And of course, it's always preferable. We only turn to numerical tools when, it, when there's no other suitable option. And finally, it's, if we're going to teach numerical modeling, it's unavoidable to teach some programming and some debugging, but I try to protect the students to the greatest degree possible from investing large amounts of time learning how to install software, run systems, uh, interact with a Linux command line, and so on. Those are things that students will pick up in good time if they choose to pursue this more seriously down the road. Uh, some other considerations when I teach modeling at the undergraduate level. The class needs to engage students with wide ranging interests. I'm very excited about geodynamics, but I also need to be able to convey uh, these general concepts about modeling to students with interest in glaciology, hydrogeology, landscape evolution, petroleum geology, reservoir processes, um, sediment transport, and of course, also some geodynamics. But these other fields represent the majority of the students, and typically just a few students in the classroom have uh, a pre existing interest in geodynamics when they sit down to that first lecture. Uh, most of the students who graduate from this class, and indeed most undergraduate geology programs, aren't going to do modeling 
full time as their real professional careers. But at some point, they'll probably have to interface with scientists who do develop and work with models. So it's really important that all of the students learn how to think about the design of models and learn what kinds of questions to ask when they're presented with the product or the output from a numerical model and how to work with people who do numerical modeling. And finally, uh, most of the geology students, this is the reality of teaching in geology programs in the United States in particular, uh, most geology students have fairly limited experience with quantitative problem solving relative to students in, say, physics who are used to doing quantitative problem sets on a weekly basis for multiple classes. So uh, we have to learn to work with the students that we have and to try to help them um, as best as possible develop some proficiency in modeling. In the class, I try to emphasize that a model is not what you see here. A model is not meant to be a miniaturization of nature, complete with all of its complexity. Typically, when we try to make models that are as complex as possible or include all elements of a natural system, we learn very little because it's very difficult to ascertain how model choices uh, affect the results that we obtain. So the types of models that we concern ourselves are typically with are typically um, dynamical models, which are a more abstract concept that students um, require quite a bit of practice to, to gain some insight into. So a model is defined here as a collection of assumptions, uh, physical laws, boundary conditions that allow us to make predictions about how geologic processes uh, should work. And then we can compare those model predictions with observations to hopefully gain insight into natural processes. So in the context of teaching modeling, this is how I define a model. And I emphasize to a large extent the process of model development. I closely follow the textbook by Slingerland and Kump um, here in trying to kind of develop a framework, a set of steps that students follow in terms of addressing a problem quantitatively. So first defining a question to be addressed, then defining the physical processes that will operate within the model and the boundary conditions on that model. We then proceed to write down all of the physical laws that are applicable to the problem. We clearly state any uh, simplifying assumptions that are made. Then we go on to write a statement of balance, first in words and then in symbols. I think this is really important and useful. Many students struggle to immediately write down a conservation law, say a statement of momentum conservation, but they can describe qualitatively what matters or what's being balanced in the system. Uh, so writing a statement like the time rate of change of energy inside my box is equal to the rate of something minus the rate of something else. We then translate this um, statement of balance in words to a mathematical statement. This often takes the form of either ordinary or partial differential equations. Of course, then we have to check all of the units in the mathematical expressions. In my experience, if students have the correct units, if their expressions are dimensionally consistent, 90% of the time the, uh, the equation is correct and the solution will be correct as well. Uh, then we go on to write down the initial and boundary conditions that describe or govern the model. And finally, we verify, validate, and solve the model. We'll go through an example of this process, one that I use in my teaching in the next slides. So this is actually the simplest example of a box model or a zero dimensional model that I use when I'm teaching modeling at the undergraduate level. The question to be addressed here we're given some measurements of isotopic ratios. I apologize for the quality of this figure. It looked better on my computer. Uh, but we're given measurements of the uranium to lead isotopic ratio um, in two different isotopic systems. This is a Concordia diagram, of course. And the dots that are shown, I think you can see my cursor right here. 
uh, are individual sample measurements of materials collected from um, the moon's surface. And so the question is, how old are the lunar samples whose uranium lead isotopic ratios are shown below? Our approach to addressing these questions is first to define the physical processes operating in the model and the boundary conditions. So we're going to view um, a zircon crystal as a box. And that zircon crystal, or the box, incorporates the parent nuclide here represented by these red dots. And the process that's operating within this box is radioactive decay. So over time, these red parent nuclide um, uh, uh, nuclides decay and produce the blue daughter nuclides. So if we can understand the decay process, we can determine the amount of time that's elapsed from the initial condition, that's the image on the left, to the sample uh, on the right, which would contain an isotopic ratio of three to four in this case, three daughter nuclides and one parent nuclide, and we can use that to date the rock. rock. Um, we can write down the physical laws that are operating. So the law here is the Rutherford-Curie law. Um, the time rate of change of the number of atoms is equal to a negative constant, the decay constant times the current number of atoms of the parent nuclide. Um, we state any restrictive assumptions. This could be the interactive portion of the talk if anybody wants to chime in and describe some of the simplifying assumptions that need to be made in this model. You can feel free to do so now. Or we can just continue on and state some of the assumptions. This is by no means an exhaustive list of assumptions, but we assume that that decay constant is insensitive to pressure and temperature or environmental conditions, chemistry. Importantly, critically actually, we assume that there are no additional sources or sinks of parent or daughter nuclides. So the zircon crystal acts as a closed system um, from uh, the time of uh, crystallization through the time at which the measurement is made. We write a statement of balance in words and then in mathematical symbols. And here we actually write down two statements of balance. The first, a statement of balance about the number of parent atoms, and then a statement of balance about the number of daughter atoms. These statements of balance always take the form of the time rate of change of something equals, uh, and then a source term minus a sink term. And here, the time rate of change of the number of parent atoms is equal to some constant, here a negative constant, times the number of parent atoms that currently exist. And the time rate of change of the number of daughter atoms is equal to the opposite of the time rate of change of the number of parent atoms. This results in uh, two coupled ordinary differential equations. The first is the decay equation, which is familiar to all of us. So dp, that's the number of parent atoms, dt is equal to minus lambda times p. And the time rate of change of the daughter atoms is shown in the second equation. We verify units. So we would go through and demonstrate that the units of each of these terms is just some number per time. So the, each term has the units of inverse time. We write down the initial and boundary conditions. Here, we don't have to really concern ourselves with the boundary conditions. We already assume that the system is closed. So in a sense, that is the boundary condition on our system. And the initial conditions, we assume that there's no daughter pre nuclide present initially, and we assume some initial amount, uh, some initial number of the parent nuclide. We'll call that P naught. Uh, let's see. Then we can go on and uh, verify, validate, and solve the mathematical model that we have. This is a first order ODE. It has a simple analytic solution. And because many of the students that I'm teaching at the undergraduate level have never had to solve a differential equation before, we actually do a couple of problem sets and spend quite a bit of time learning how to solve ODEs using separation of variables. We use the first several chapters, the first three chapters actually, of the Blanchard, Devaney, and Hall differential equations textbook to do this. That's a very applied differential equations textbook. Um, and I think it's actually very well suited for the type of students that, um, that we work with. Uh, so we solve these equations. The solution is shown here. And after obtaining solutions for 
how the number of parent atoms varies over time and how the number of daughter atoms varies over time. We can obtain exp an expression for the ratio of daughter atoms to parent atoms, which is shown in the lower right. Of course, the decay constant here is specific to the isotopic system considered. So going back to the Concordia that I used to motivate this exercise, these two systems have different um, decay constants associated with them. And because of that, they evolve at different rates. And that's really important actually in the uranium lead system because it allows us to uh, measure age two different ways. Um, and that actually allows us to figure out whether, for instance, um, lead has been lost, violating the assumptions that we used in formulating our model. So let's go on and think about how we might use this in an uh, undergraduate modeling class uh, and how it might fit into the bigger picture structure of a quarter long class in modeling. This is what I typically do in a 10 week quarter. So I'll just take you through it week by week. Um, week one is kind of an introduction to modeling. We do a Newtonian cooling problem, trying to understand actually some data that we collect in class. Typically I bring in a mug full of coffee and we measure its temperature during the course of a class period. And it turns out that temperature decreases. It's very well um, approximated by an exponentially decreasing function that asymptotically approaches the room temperature. We build a physical model, um, assuming Newtonian cooling, and we talk about how to fit curves to data. That's week one. In lab, we have to spend some time uh, doing a Python refresher. So I've already uh, skipped ahead here and said that we're using Python. I have used MATLAB in the past, but uh, the point is that in week one, we had to set aside time to bring everybody up to speed on some basic programming tasks, how to write functions, how to index into arrays, how to write for loops, and so on. Week two, we do the radiometric dating exercise that I just went through briefly. The equation is the decay equation. Um, I introduce separation of variables. Then in week three, we actually do the same problem again, except that we solve the same equation numerically. So we talk about some very simple approaches for numerical integration of ODEs. We use exclusively finite difference methods because they're easy to code and relatively easy to understand. We can motivate this both geometrically and also mathematically by deriving finite difference formulas, either um, geometrically, thinking about tangents and secants to the solution, or mathematically by taking a Taylor series expansion and truncating it to obtain finite difference rules. It turns out that some students have an easier time um, thinking about discretization of these ODEs with one of those approaches and others um, have an easier time understanding what's going on, say, with the mathematical derivation. In week four, we take this one step for further um, with a global carbon cycle box model, the Rothman Ocean problem. This is an exercise taken from the Slinger Linden Kump textbook, and there the students solve coupled linear ODEs using both uh, forward and backward Euler time integration. Uh, week five, we start to transition into partial differential equations. So we have to spend some time building intuition into vector calculus operations. So divergence, gradient, um, we don't do curl, but we think about what the Laplacian is and develop some uh, qualitative understanding about how solutions will evolve, um, motivated by the heat equation. So taking some uh, function that describes a temperature distribution and thinking about um, calculating curvature from that temperature distribution and thinking about where the temperature is likely to decrease and where it's likely to increase. The next week, we solve the steady diffusion equation. We apply this both to heat conduction, so one-dimensional heat conduction with internal heating, and we also apply it to a groundwater flow problem that's solved um, in cylindrical coordinates, looking at flow towards a well, steady flow towards a well. Um, so here, the students are, for the first time, uh, using centered finite difference approximation to solve um, a system of equations 
that's represented by um, a matrix multiplied by a vector is equal to another vector. So they're solving a linear system for the first time here. Um, then we do a SCARP diffusion problem, solving the time-dependent diffusion equation, dating SCARP-like landforms in Southern California. Uh, here they read a research paper, actually, by Tom Hanks from the USGS, and uh, apply their simple numerical model to some real SCARP-like landforms. I provide some observations, and they try to date the SCARP-like landforms, given some information about an effective uh, slope diffusivity from the literature. Then we move on to the advection diffusion equation. We do a problem related to solute transport in rivers. And there they're introduced to the concept of upwinding. We talk about different advection methods. We use uh, very simple methods, just um, simple upwinding, and then more complex advection schemes like quick and quickest that are used in the um, environmental sciences. Finally, in week nine, typically we do elastic wave propagation. We solve a one-dimensional wave equation. And uh, this is particularly exciting for the students because they get to make movies. And finally, in week 10, uh, time is set aside for the students to do final projects. Uh, the final projects are defined earlier in the class. The students have to uh, develop a proposal. I tell them whether it's feasible or not. Uh, they go on and develop a description of the model, write down some equations, and solve them. And in place of a sit-down final exam, typically I do a laboratory final, a practical final during the lab period. And then students will give a brief, typically four or five minute oral presentation of their final project at the very end. So it gives students opportunity to also develop their presentation skills, um, which is, um, of course, a very important skill that all scientists need to have. So through the 10 weeks, we, we build, um, I guess, a, success, a succession of increasingly complex models, starting with zero-dimensional models, moving to one-dimensional models that are steady, then introducing time dependence. And uh, we study it at some point and in some way um, all of the equations that are important in describing Earth's processes. So decay, diffusion, and advection diffusion. Oh, and the wave equation, of course. So moving on, uh, what books do we choose to accompany um, this type of curriculum? Well, it's tough, actually. There's no book that's perfect, in my view. A bunch of different options are shown here, ranging from the very mathematical on the far left, um, which doesn't really include any geology at all, uh, to methods or books that are specific to geodynamics. Um, the excellent numerical modeling textbook by Taras Garia, who spoke in the uh, previous month's uh, webinar. Books that are more um, geared towards uh, general purpose computation and programming um, in Python here. And then the Slinger Linden Comp book, Introduction to um, Mathematical Modeling of Earth's Dynamical Systems, a primer. I actually rather like this book, and I've used it several times. I've also used this book, the Python book, which is um, adopted by uh, MIT. For graduate level classes, I also um, very much like Torsten Becker and uh, Boris Kaus's numerical modeling notes, which are freely available online. So what language do we use for this class? Obviously, these various lab exercises require programming and debugging. and in my view, there are a couple real choices. Um, there are probably some additional choices, and um, if you want to discuss the pros and cons of any of those after the presentation, I'd be happy to. But basically, for me, it was a choice between MATLAB and Python. Um, the basic requirements, of course, are that the package needs to be installable on the university's lab computers, that it needs to integrate programming, debugging, and plotting in a relatively um, simple way. So one program that does everything. Uh, and ideally, it should be something that the students can install and use on their own program, or sorry, on their own computers as well when they're at home. So uh, let's see, very briefly, MATLAB can be extremely expensive. It's cheap for students, and then it gets more and more expensive. Uh, Python is free in every way. MATLAB comes with professional support. 
Python comes with uh, some form of support through the community, but um, certainly not a number or an email address that you can rely on getting a, a response from in 24 hours. Uh, both languages have some very unfortunate syntax choices. Um, MATLAB in particular has multiple uses of parentheses. You can use parentheses to call functions, to index into arrays, and also to group algebraic expressions. And I find this to be actually um, the greatest barrier to student success with MATLAB, this choice to use parentheses both for function calls, uh, the way that you would in an analytic mathematical expressions, and also for array indexing. So I think they could have done a lot better with this choice. Um, in Python, on the other hand, all grouping of code into blocks is done with indentation. And this can be very difficult to read, especially when you end up with multiple levels of indentation within one program. Both languages can be very quick or very slow, depending on how well you program. Uh, both are extensible, MATLAB through toolboxes, which you have to pay a lot of money for, and Python through packages, which are free. There are more of them every day uh, in MATLAB. Most of the functionality at this point is very mature. In Python, the functionality is changing quickly, and even the syntax and behavior of important subroutines is changing between releases. Uh, let's see, MATLAB um, is an integrated development environment with plotting and um, decent 2D and 3D graphics. In Python, there are solutions to provide this functionality. Um, both are relatively easy to install and to um, uh, work with at home for students. Finally, this is a really important consideration. Um, we thought originally that teaching MATLAB to students would give them a leg up in the job market. We thought that being able to list proficiency with MATLAB as a skill on their resume might make them more competitive. And ultimately, we did not see that this was the case. Um, because firms typically um, can only afford a limited number of MATLAB licenses. And so people who use MATLAB use it intensively. And otherwise, uh, people use other, other software products. So for most of our students, we didn't see this as a big selling point. Um, maybe MATLAB gives them a leg up for some data science careers, but I think no more so than Python. Uh, we do think Python is actually more appealing in terms of a skill that you can list on a resume. First of all, it starts to qualify you for real programming jobs. Second, um, Python is a scripting language that can interface with ArcGIS. Um, a lot of our graduates went on to work in um, the geospatial field, and so knowing some scripting for GIS gives them a leg up, certainly. For people who do geodynamic modeling, it's also the scripting language that interfaces with Paraview, so it can be used for data analysis. And of course, uh, it's a valuable skill for those who want to go on into data science careers. So for all of these reasons, we've decided to adopt Python in our teaching. And I didn't know any Python when we decided to make the switch. So it was an exciting and interesting opportunity for me to learn a new programming language while teaching it simultaneously for the first time. The environment that we chose for teaching was JupyterHub using something called uh, NBGrader that plugs into JupyterHub and is designed specifically for teaching. Uh, this diagram is very helpful if you already know what all of these different components are, but it's easier just to show you after briefly describing what the different things involved with JupyterHub are. Basically, the idea here is that the students will do all of their programming. In fact, they'll complete all of their lab exercise in a web browser. So previously when I had taught numerical modeling using MATLAB, students would turn in a written component of their lab where they would write down equations and respond to short answer questions and so on. And then they would also turn in their code separately. This made grading challenging. But with Jupyter Hub, with Jupyter Notebooks, in fact, we're able to merge um, Markdown, which can include mathematical equations, short answer, and code and plots all in one document. So I think this is really, really nice for the classroom. It also has the appeal that the students are all doing their work in their browser. 
they're connecting to a single computer, which is serving this uh, website that the students access. And Jupyter Hub behind the scenes is providing uh, kind of all of the um, uh, mechanics to authenticate users, to keep track of users, to start their individual um, notebooks, which are running on the server. And uh, all of the assignment data is also stored there. So all of the data resides on a remote computer. And in principle, they can use this from anywhere on campus. And depending on how the campus network security is set up, they can do this at home too. So what I'm gonna do is briefly tell you why this is an advantage over using individual computers. And then we'll have a, a brief demo of the way that I use Jupyter Hub in my teaching. Uh, first of all, with Jupyter Hub, all of the students share a common version of the Python packages. So everything is running on one server, and that means everybody has the same version of NumPy. That's basically the linear algebra routines. They have the same version of SciPy. Uh, that means that if one student produces a plot on their own computer, it's going to look the same as if I run the code on my computer. That makes grading much, much easier than if people are using different versions or you know, even different Python versions, Python 2 versus Python 3. Everybody is using Python 3. Everybody is using the same packages. The students can work on their stuff anywhere. Uh, it's really easy to seamlessly mix the text, equations, computer codes, and plots. It's difficult to break this beyond repair. So even with MATLAB on individual student laptops, there's a certain amount of time that's spent dealing with um, sysadmin kind of stuff or students' laptops crashing. So as long as the server stays running, and I do acknowledge that that is a big if, as long as this happens, um, uh, we're unlikely to have to really troubleshoot technical issues related to um, things outside of Jupyter. It's very easy to distribute and collect the lab assignments using this NB grader thing that I'll show you in a couple slides. And that said, there's some disadvantages. There's a lot of administrative stuff to deal with on your side as a teacher. So this is honestly something that's really only worthwhile if you have a, some critical number of students, which in my estimation is probably around 30. So I typically had 35 students in a class. And so it was worth it to me to spend actually a couple full work days setting all this stuff up, figuring out how it worked in order to save time down the road uh, with grading and uh, distributing labs and so on. So you pretty much have to understand Docker containers. You have to understand SQL certificates and a little bit about network security. And you have to be able to do user level administration stuff. Basically, this whole lab system is running on a computer. In this case, it's my workstation that's sitting under my desk here, which has 20 cores. And in my experience, that was more than adequate to serve Jupyter Notebooks to a class of 35 students. Um, and so rather than letting all of this stuff just run on my computer in an unprotected environment, uh, everything that the students see is running within a Docker container. It's kind of like a lightweight virtual machine. Uh, some people would probably throw stones at me for describing it this way, but to the extent that it matters here, I think that's a reasonable description. That Docker container uh, is actually exposed to the internet through secure HTTP on port 443, which is the HTTPS port. There has to be a SQL certificate associated with that HTTPS. There's a certain amount of network security that you have to understand in order to be able to set this up. And then of course, within that Docker container, you have to create user accounts for each of the students and manage authentication. As I'll show you in a minute, that's actually implemented through the OAuth standard, you can use either um, open authentication provided by, say, Google, um, using a Google login, or you can use GitHub OAuth, which is the route that I chose to go with my students, because there are good tutorials about how to set this up already. Um, uh, okay, so going on with disadvantages, let's see, the interface, the basic behavior is still changing between releases. In fact, to do the demo today, I just spend a little bit of time updating everything for the most recent version of Jupyter Hub. So it's basically pre-release -pre software, and you're going to have to deal with this. You have to rely on community support. 
you're inevitably going to run into some problems that um, are unique to the type of setup that you're doing. And so you'll either have to figure it out yourself or ask somebody to help you along the way. And fortunately, there are mailing lists and discussion groups uh, to help with this. So what I'm going to do next is fire up Jupyter Hub, and I'm going to demonstrate um, from the student side, signing in, uh, fetching an assignment, completing it, uh, the tests that are run on this assignment, and uh, then the validation of the assignment, basically on the student's end, checking to see whether the code is um, doing the right thing. And then there's something called a form grader. One of the things that makes this a really nice solution is that you can have tests that are applied to the student notebooks. And in fact, a certain amount of the grading can be done automatically, though inevitably um, you end up doing some manual grading. So I'm gonna quit out of PowerPoint now. Hopefully people can see this. I'm gonna switch over to first um, Chrome. And you can see here actually the instructor view. So from my view, I'm signed into this Jupyter Hub. This is just running in uh, uh, Chrome incognito tab. And you can see that there's a list of lab assignments. This is left over from when I taught last spring. And you can assign, release, uh, collect, and then grade each of the lab assignments. We'll come back to this in just a second. Uh, on the student side, in Firefox, I have running a student view of Jupyter Hub. And so the student has actually signed in already. I'll just log out and sign in again so you can see how that works. But basically, I go to this um, uh, web address. You won't be able to do this if you try to follow along from wherever you are because um, of our campus firewall. But from my computer, I can do this. And I can sign in. I'm signed in, actually, as G326 test user. And I signed in, actually, via my GitHub credentials. So if I'm logged into GitHub already, then it will just automatically log me in to the class. I can click on assignments, and I've downloaded all the assignments that are available to me right now. So you can see there's a list of assignments that have been downloaded. There's also a list of submitted assignments. I did some trial submissions um, in advance of this talk. So I'm going to open this. We can see that Lab Zero has only one problem. Lab Zero was actually meant to just test and make sure that everybody could successfully submit lab exercises. This was a super important test to do on week one of lab. But you can see basically the kinds of things that you can do within Jupyter Notebooks here. We can mix actually instructions. Some cells within this notebook are uh, just descriptive text, directives to the students. So we'll use this lab to test the functionality of the lab assignment system. And if you can see it, you're off to a great start. Okay, so for the first problem, they were asked just to write a really simple Python function that returns a list of numbers um, between uh, one and n, such that that list contains the squares of each number between uh, one and n. So, uh, oh, and then it should also raise an exception if the function is called with a value of n that's not reasonable. So I don't want to do a lot of interactive or non-interactive for you programming. We'll just do a tiny little bit here, and we'll just say, uh, well, we're going to generate this sequence of numbers. So let's just make an empty list. Let's write a for loop. I will go in the range from 0 to n plus 1. And at each step in this for loop, we'll say l dot append um, i squared. It's very nerve wracking to do this especially in front of a silent audience. And then the function should return i. And we'll see if that worked. OK, so by pressing Shift Enter, this runs. In the next cell, the student can um, verify that actually their um, function works as behaved. Oh, it didn't quite work. I returned the wrong thing. So we should have returned l. And we can check just visually that it does the right thing. In the next. Uh, code block here, something really important happens. There's a series of assertion statements, and each of these assert statements checks that the output works correctly for certain inputs. So the function behaves as is expected for, um, uh, for certain 
calls. And in fact, these tests can be run automatically in the background. And if we go back to this view, the student can click validate next to the problem and they can find out instantaneously whether there are gonna be errors when they turn in their homework. So this basically tells them, oh, when uh, Jupyter or when Python ran your notebook, some errors occurred. Some, um, of, some of these assertions failed and they can basically understand that if that happens, they're not gonna get a perfect score. So in fact, these tests that appeared in the notebook are run inside an auto grader. And so you can assign a certain amount or certain number of points associated with passing all of these tests. So for instance, the student might get four points if their code checks out uh, or zero otherwise. It's binary in this case. So I like this for a number of different reasons. One, students can find out instantly in lab whether they're on the right track. This is really important because even with an instructor and a couple of TAs, it's difficult to help everybody debug their code at once. And here at least, they can understand whether they're right or not before they move on to the next part of the lab exercise. It's also very convenient for grading because we can, uh, provided that we can write good auto grader tests, and that's a bit of an art, then um, uh, a lot of the grading, a lot of the uh, very tedious grading of code can be done automatically. Of course, you have to think about the various ways in which students can try to circumvent the auto grader. For instance, they can write um, uh, a squares function here in block three that passed for all of these um, test cases, but might not work in general. So unfortunately, um, it's not a perfect solution, but it actually goes a long way towards um, eliminating a lot of the instructor workload associated with grading. So on the instructor side, we can go over here and once uh, homeworks have been submitted, we can look at the um, uh, collected assignments. We can click this collect button. Uh, there's some issues actually with the way this is installed right now. Well, that's great. I'm not gonna try to debug this in front of you, but you can uh, just take my word that this does generally work. Um, when we go to the form grader, we should be able to see the student submissions. And in fact, one of the things that I really like about it is that you can grade each subpart of a lab on its own. So rather than grading a whole lab exercise sequentially, you grade part one of every student's lab and then move on to part two and so on. And actually the student name by default is uh, obscured. So all of the grading is done blind and this helps to eliminate any kind of unconscious bias that you might have when you're grading the homework. And I actually learned a lot about how I grade from doing it this way. And I think that you might be surprised about how differently you grade assignments and even write assignments once you've tried grading this way. So uh, going back now to the PowerPoint slides, um, let's go on actually to the kinds of things that I've tried to emphasize in graduate classes. So I'm gonna talk here specifically about the kinds of things that I did when I taught graduate level geodynamic modeling. Here, um, the class was a, a mixture of lectures, mostly at the chalkboard, but some PowerPoint, and a lot of paper reading and discussion. So I assign papers every week, and one student takes the lead and presents the paper, leads discussion, and sometimes, uh, typically, we, we allow maybe 30 minutes of class time per paper, and uh, if you're curious, the reading list um, is available on the website that'll be shown on the next slide. But the emphasis here really was on identifying interesting questions, thinking about how to formulate hypotheses, how to design models to test those hypotheses, how to design geodynamic models and develop some intuition into the formulation of these numerical models. And then a little bit more on the mathematical aspects of modeling that we typically would just have to gloss over in an undergraduate modeling class, especially a 10-week class. Uh, so let's see, when I've taught graduate geodynamic modeling in the past, obviously uh, the students that take the class have a mixture of different backgrounds from 
glaciology to mantle geodynamics to um, uh, students in, in a range of different uh, subfields who are just taking the class because they've always been a little bit curious about what goes on in geodynamic modeling. So um, because of the mixture of different backgrounds, I really emphasize building intuition into the models uh, through building, starting with very, very simple models and gradually increasing complexity and thinking about uh, what effects each additional physical complexity uh, has on model behavior. When I taught this um, last year, we actually used Aspect in the classroom. Aspect is the advanced solver for problems in Earth's convection. I'm sure most of the people listening to this already know what it is, but uh, in the classroom, we provided the Aspect in virtual machine on uh, a USB thumb drive, a USB 3.0 high-speed thumb drive, in fact, and it was kind of interesting working with a code in the classroom that was evolving continuously, even over the course of the quarter. Additional features became available that we actually wanted to use, so we had to update the copy of Aspect that was installed in the virtual machine a couple of times during the 10-week quarter. In that virtual machine, I also provided students, in addition to Aspect, the development version, I provided Paraview and Visit. I also provided them site-licensed MATLAB on the virtual machine because of the nature of the site license that we had. That was something that I could do. I know it's not possible everywhere. In that class, we did entirely two-dimensional calculations, nothing 3D, and that was primarily just um, a pragmatic choice. 2D models can be run in a reasonable amount of time, even on a student laptop, and the kinds of models that were state-of-the-art in the 1990s can pretty reasonably now be run on a virtual machine on modern laptop hardware. Uh, for a couple students, they also used on-campus, um, I wouldn't say high-performance computing, but workstations that have more than four compute cores available uh, for their final projects and for some homework assignments that required running a lot of models. Importantly, this was also an opportunity for me to develop familiar, familiarity with Aspect. In my own work, I use a combination of my own uh, code based on um, uh, hybrid finite volume and marker and cell approach, and also sitcom S for global scale models. And I wanted to transition eventually um, to using Aspect for global scale models because of the uh, huge advantages of adaptive mesh refinement. So in order to build familiarity and build confidence that Aspect is solving the right equations and doing it correctly, uh, this course was actually an important opportunity for me as well. So over the course of a quarter, I had the graduate students uh, start very simple, verifying the linear stability analysis for the onset of convection in um, uh, isoviscous layer heated from below. Then they went on to look at heat transport scaling uh, for similar setup, so no internal heating, but just for basally heated um, convection. Then they introduced depth-dependent viscosity and looked at effects on various aspects of mantle convection. They investigated the importance of temperature-dependent viscosity. They looked at uh, heat transport scaling, also on um, qualitative aspects of the behavior of the um, uh, mantle once uh, viscosity depth dependence was introduced. They looked at the uh, effects of a viscosity increase at the 660 on mantle mixing. That uh, exercise had kind of mixed results, actually. It's a difficult problem. And then finally, they did some work introducing yielding rheologies and trying to produce plate-like flows. So I'll talk just briefly about one of the exercises. So basically, the first exercise that I signed in the class was to try to reproduce the um, linear stability analysis for the onset of convection in a fluid layer heated from below in 2D using aspect. Um, so basically looking at Turcotte and Schubert third edition, uh, section 6.19, and trying to reproduce um, the uh, prediction of the critical Rayleigh number and also the gross rate of convective instabilities. So I'll show you actually um, one of the um, kind of bonuses of doing this. This actually went on to be included in Aspect as a benchmark. 
I actually implemented it in the form of a, a Jupyter notebook. And this is now part of the main aspect code. And it's also reproduced in the manual. Um, so various numerical simulations were run with different aspect ratios. Um, otherwise, kind of nominally Earth-like uh, dimensional parameters went into these models. And so it was an exercise for the students to think about um, non-dimensionalization of problems and how to control the dimensionless number here, the, the Rayleigh number, um, by varying the dimensional pro uh, properties of their models, and then how to best explore parameter space. So just briefly here, the figure on the left shows the critical Rayleigh number on the vertical axis. It shows uh, the aspect ratio of the system on the horizontal axis, uh, 2 pi b over lambda. And it shows the stable and unstable regions predicted uh, from the linear stability analysis. And the analytic result is shown with the green dashed curve. Numerical models that were unstable, so in which convective instabilities grow, are indicated with the red dots. And the black dots indicate cases that were run um, in which the system didn't convect. So any initial perturbation just decayed away. I should say temperature perturbation decayed away. And uh, I also show the relative error between the theoretical prediction and the numerical result in the panel on the right. And you can see that Aspect does uh, actually a very, very good job here. So uh, that's actually um, all that we have time for today. I'd be happy to take any questions at this point, and I'd just like to take a minute to acknowledge many students and TAs that I had at Portland State who were my guinea pigs and assistants in doing all of this stuff. Uh, CIG for uh, support to participate in Aspect um, hackathons and also in the, um, you know, generally for the development of the Aspect code which we used. And of course, for the many people on the Aspect developers mailing list, the main Aspect developers and also other people in the community who helped us get up to speed with this stuff and the people who developed and uh, try to help people along with Jupyter and, uh, and be greater. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot, Max. And always thanks for risking those ever popular live demos. <laughs> you did it. I really you just can't that. win, can you? <laughs> but you, the, the typing was, was pretty good on the, on the, um, the Python there. Um, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> just an FYI for those who, who think they might want to try Aspect. Aspect is also available in a Docker container. So if you want more information on Aspect in, it, in the Docker container and notebook versions, of um, benchmarks and tutorials and aspect, please just um, email me at events.geodynamics.org. Um, if you have any questions, please just unmute your mic or type into the chat box. Um, so a few announcements is that there will be no webinar in December due to AGU, and we will resume actually in February with Gabriella Mora from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. For those of you who are going to AGU, we hope to see you at our business meeting. That'll be Monday night, starting at 6 p.m. reception. The meeting will be at 7, so it gives you some time to grab a beer at the convention center and head on over to the Hilton Garden Inn, which is just a block and a half away. So um, if there's any questions, again, please just unmute your mic or type in the chat window. I was curious, um, and thank you for showing me NB Grader. It looks like a really great tool. I was wondering sort of what you discovered your biases were after you were grading blind. Yeah, that's a really good question. And there's, there's certainly, um, Often when you're grading, especially if you grade sequentially through an entire laboratory assignment, it's easy for there to be a positive or negative feedback mechanism. If a student does very well in the first part of a lab, to just assume that the rest is done correctly without really critically evaluating it. Time is constrained for all of us, and I'm sure that we all rush through grading more than, than we would really like to. And so that's actually one thing that I think it really helped me with was by randomizing um, uh, the order in which I saw the labs. I wasn't able to associate kind of part one with a student's lab with the second part very easily. Uh, it's also 
refreshing not to have to deal with being able to recognize certain students' handwriting. <laughs> so, <laughs> are there typing? I'm sure we've all encountered that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That once you see certain handwriting, you you form a preconceived notion that they're likely to do well or poorly on a lab. Max, I had a quick question. And so then many students I, or young students I find seem to take more naturally to MATLAB than Python. Maybe that's just been the bias for how, for how the number of students I've seen. But my question is, have you looked into the Julia language at all? It no, seems I haven't to be looked at the, the Yeah, it seems. So that sort of seems to be a nice combination, at least mm -hmm. stylistically, taking has more structured like MATLAB in terms of the language itself, but has many advantages of Python that it's free and it's quite quick, so. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, I don't think it has nearly as many features as Python in terms of all of the libraries and, and maybe the integration with Jupyter, but that's maybe in a few years one avenue to go down. I guess without knowing more about Julia, it's, I can't speak specifically to that. Some things that I really like about Python are that um, for computationally intensive things, you can still call C subroutines. Yeah. And so code can run at the speed of compiled code. Um, yeah. It's also, once students learn a little bit of Python, then um, they can start working with things like Burn Man and OBSPy. And yeah. so, um, it seems to be one of the reasons that I chose it was frankly because it seems to be gaining momentum in the solid earth community. The next generation seems to use uh, Python extensively in their work. Yeah. I'll just make one plug for Julia as I know that Julia okay. is starting to be supported within the Jupyter Notebook environment. So anybody who, who's thinking about um, teaching UC Julia, that is certainly will be an option in the future. So with that, um, I'm hoping that uh, Max doesn't waste too many good cups of coffee in his labs. <laughs> um, but thank him a lot very much for spending some time today and giving us a really good overview of what it takes to teach geodynamics in the classroom and the trade-offs and the technical skills and knowledge it needs to, um, to, to um, do research in this very specialized field. So Gad, yeah, thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone for your attention.